Hello everyone, and welcome back to Chess Openings Explained. My name is Caleb Denby, and today I'm taking you through part two of the Learn the Nidorf series with me, Caleb. Uh, of course, in the first episode, I started going over the lines with Bishop E2. Uh, so this is kind of known as the more positional approach to the Nidorf. Of course, there are some sharp lines in it as well. Uh, but all of the lines that I covered in the first episode sort of revolved around the move uh, 7, knight b3 for white, and then white going ahead and castling, taking, you know, kind of the classical positional approach to the position, uh, trying to, you know, control squares and things of that nature. So today I wanted to go over all those lines that I didn't cover in the first lecture, mainly all of the lines where white either delays castling kingside or doesn't castle kingside at all, or uh, we'll see one deviation on move 7 that has recently, well I guess, semi-recently become popular thanks to the world champion. So let's jump into it here. Uh, of course, this variation starts with e4, uh, c5, knight f3, d6, d4, takes takes, knight f6, knight c3, and a6, entering the knightorf. And once again, we are looking at the bishop e2 lines, the positional approach. Uh, now the move e5 is the way to continue. And in all of the uh, first episode's lines, we were looking at ideas of knight b3, bishop b7, and at some point castles. Sometimes queen d3 and then castles, but mainly castles immediately. Uh, now I wanted to look at a few different things, starting with this move, bishop e3. So with bishop e3, of course, white is not castling yet. What's the downside to playing bishop e3? Well, you're committing this bishop to e3 fairly early on, which means ideas of playing f4 are a little bit less uh, threatening, uh, mainly because you want to recapture with the bishop. Also, ideas of bishop g5 are, of course, a lot less threatening as well, because you've committed this bishop to e3. So the upside, you don't commit to castling. The downside, you do commit to something with bishop e3, meaning that these two ideas are a little bit less scary. Now, as in the first lecture, uh, bishop e3 is sort of the signal to play the move bishop e6, because once again, as I said, the move f4 is a lot less scary now. We can pretty comfortably capture on f4, and this bishop has wasted some time moving twice as we've seen previously. So bishop e6, and now there are a few ideas here. Uh, white could definitely still just castle, and then we transpose to the lines that we looked at in the first lecture with knight bd7, and this is all stuff that we've seen before. Uh, if white doesn't want to go for this, he has a couple different options here as well. Uh, namely, the move knight d5, or the move queen d3 followed by knight d5, or as we'll see in our main variation of this line, there is a pretty new idea, uh, I believe introduced by Wesley So at an Olympiad, that revolves around playing h4 before doing any of these things. So we're going to look at all of this. Let's start with the most direct move, knight d5 immediately. So white is taking control of the d5 square without castling, which of course leaves the option open for white to castle queenside at a later date. This is sort of the reason for not castling kingside immediately. Uh, now, at first glance, it looks as though this pawn on e4 is hanging. Of course, tactically, this doesn't work out because the move uh, bishop b6 is going to be quite strong. Uh, this bishop controls c7, the knight can hop in, and white would win at least an exchange on the a8 square. So no taking there just yet, which is why the move knight, BD, knight bd7 is the most common, and I believe the best just defending the b6 square. And now, unfortunately for white, this is going to be an actual problem on e4, so the move queen d3 is to be recommended here. Uh, of course, you can actually achieve this move this uh, by a different move order, but here black can still comfortably play knight b to d7, and after knight d5, we get the same exact uh, position. So, queen d3, and now what's going on here? Uh, well, black has a few options here. Black could sort of just castle and allow this knight to stay here for a moment or two longer. Uh, but then you might run into some things involving this move c4. And the, the lines from here get rather complicated. I don't think they're bad for black, but there's no reason to allow this sort of shenanigans when you can just capture this piece immediately with bishop takes d5. Now, there's never any c takes d5 to worry about. Uh, now, e takes d5. 
And I think the next move by black is pretty important, uh, just the move rook c8. And with this rook on c8, uh, white is actually going to have some pretty serious difficulties now following through uh, kind of on his promise to castle queen's side. So with this accurate move order, with bringing this rook to c8, now uh, after c4, uh, defending this pawn. If white doesn't play this way, by the way, be on the lookout for the move knight b6, when you might never be able to play the move c4. Uh, in fact, you might have to capture this guy, which is pretty devastating. So c4 immediately, castles by black, and now just castles by white. You know, obviously you're not castling queenside into the move b5 anymore. So castles by white. And then this is, once again, going to be very, very similar to ideas that we've seen uh, in the first lecture. Uh, just important to note that we need this slightly accurate move order with rook c8 to discourage any queenside castles. And now we can go back to usual business with the move like knight e8 and playing for ideas of f5. Uh, okay, so backing up, there is, like I said, a better move order here for white, introduced by Wesley So. Rather than going for knight d5 or queen d3 immediately, the move h4 is actually a really nice idea by white to sort of keep the pressure up. Now against h4, there's a very, very common response in many openings, and here it makes sense as well. Uh, simply the move h5, meeting white on the king's side, responding to h4 with h5, taking control of some light squares and not allowing white to sort of gain a ton of extra space with something like uh, h5 or the move g4. Now h5 obviously comes with uh, a pretty substantial downside. Uh, you might think that the downside is that this pawn is going to be weak on h5, and while this sometimes can be true, it's pretty easily defended by the move g6. Rather, the weakness is not the pawn itself on h5, but the g5 square. So it's important to understand that h5 is generally uh, fine for black if this dark squared bishop has already moved. However, if we compare a very similar position and h4 here, h5 might be less good because now bishop g5 would be very playable in one turn rather than wasting a tempo after bishop e3. So we'll talk about h4 here uh, a little bit later, but sticking with this, bishop e3, bishop e6, h4. Now h5 is fine because bishop g5 is very much a loss of tempo here. Uh, now after knight d5, uh, there is a little bit of a difference. In the previous positions, uh, the move knight b to d7 was the move we were looking at, with the point being we are challenging now this e4 pawn. But thanks to h4 and h5, knight d5 actually came with a little bit of a threat. So who here understands what white was threatening with h4 and h5 included, and what white should play in this position? Who in the chat thinks they have it? Who's got it here? <clears throat> what do we think? All right, nobody knows. Nobody knows the answer today. <clears throat> uh, Arda says f4. That's not going to be the idea here, unfortunately. Uh, f4, I think, would still run into this move, knight takes e4. And it's all kind of falling apart now for, for white, actually, with this pawn in h4 turning out to be a weakness in it of, on its own, I guess. <laughs> be a weakness itself. Uh, instead, what white is threatening here is to actually capture this bishop on e7. And after queen e7, now the move bishop g5 is going to be rather awkward. Once again, with this pawn on h5, the g5 square is horribly weakened. And now uh, black desperately would like to play the move h6, but it is highly, highly illegal in this case. Note that in the initial line we looked at, knight d5, knight bd7. If white tried something similar here, now the move h6 would be quite strong, and a move like bishop h4 would be met immediately with g5, and all of a sudden it's uh, this pawn on e4 that is going to suffer. But in this other line, it is very much relevant that uh, knight takes e7 and bishop g5 exists in the position. Uh, definitely have to be on the lookout 
for this idea. So for that reason, we just simply don't give white the chance to capture on the e7 square and play bishop takes d5 first. Now after e takes d5, knight bd7, we have something very, very similar to the lines that we've looked at. However, notably, white has not really wasted a tempo on the move queen d3. That's why it does seem like this line is a little bit of an improved version of the first line we looked at today. Uh, not to worry though, because black is still doing just fine. Uh, the move c4 is mo the most common to support this guy over here. And now there are a couple games. Of course, I said Wesley So introduced this idea, and we are still following his game uh, against Marin uh, Bosiocic, I think, if I can try to pronounce his name. Uh, and in that game, uh, Marin actually played the move g6. And I think this is a little bit uh, too soft of a move, if I can use that terminology. Uh, what do I mean by that? It's a nice solidifying move. It's not a positionally bad move by any means. Uh, but it's, it's a little bit slow. And the reason for that is because the move played in the other game that's reached this position between Ariantari and, here we go, uh, Papaioapanu? Pap, pap, papai, mm, pap, papio, papioanu, that guy. Uh, and they played the move Rook C8. Uh, of course, I do think that this is a better move. And the reason for that is it's actually sort of indirectly uh, making some threats here. If white plays something like knight d2, which is a generally favorable move for white, this knight on b3 isn't perfectly placed, and white would very much like to play moves like b4 and c5, well, all of a sudden, look out, the move b5 might be coming on the board, and black would very much love to rip open this c file for himself, which is why I think rook c8 is a, a really nice move. It's always going to be a useful square for the rook, and it gives black this option of sort of playing the move uh, b5. You can compare this with the game uh, that Wesley So played, which went g6, g3, b6, and now white very comfortably played the move knight d2, and black plays the move a5. And so black does get this sort of grip on the queen side, but we'll see later in that game, uh, Wesley So actually breaks through on the king side. Uh, and that's kind of the story of this position after rook c8. Uh, in the game of Ariantari, he played the move a4 to sort of slow down these b5 ideas. And after this, uh, the move a5 was played. And I think this was the right idea from Papioano uh, with a5. So at first glance, it looks like black is totally locking down the queen side. And it's true that he is. And that is a great positional gain for black to lock down the queen side like this means that he's not going to have to worry so much about b4 and c5. However, there is a second idea in the position for white, and so we'll see in this game that it got rather complex once white started going for this idea, and I think that white uh, might have been uh, at an advantage at some point because black wasn't really adequately prepared to meet this idea. So what idea am I talking about? Well, we'll see in the game White is going to be very happy to play g3 and castle, and then white is actually playing for this move f4 that we'll see in the game. So if you find yourself in positions like these, where you've locked down the queen side, be on the lookout because your opponent might start going for these ideas of f4. This is in fact, I think, the correct way to play for white, and we'll see it didn't really work out for Ariantari in this game with white, but uh, it can be very, very dangerous. So before we look at our main game, uh, sorry to jump around, but we'll go back to Wesley So's game and see how it can all go wrong, sort of. So g6, g3, b6, a5. We see a similar lock on the position to what we got in Ariantari's game. And now the move f4 by Wesley So was played sort of immediately. And in general, uh, I looked at a lot of different variations where white ends up playing f4. And the correct response is almost always to just take this guy off the board with the move e takes f4. The reason for that is this threat of playing f5 turns out to be sort of deadly in many, many cases. In Wesley So's game, uh, his opponent played queen c8, Wesley castled. We saw knight c5, king g2, rook a7, queen c2, bishop back to d8. Uh, black trying at all costs to avoid castling into this attack. And now after the move f5, uh, white is simply winning in this position already. So definitely, these are the threats to look out for. 
and that's why it's so important to be ready to meet this move f4. Otherwise, things could go very, very wrong for you. Uh, okay, so backing on up, in our game we had rook c8, a5, g6, g3, and now knight c5 and castles. Uh, black castles as well. And now with these pieces sort of better placed, this knight on c5, this knight on f6, black is actually very much ready to meet the move f4, uh, even better than he was in the case of the game of Wesley So. Once again here, the correct response is going to be to take on f4, and after bishop takes f4, there is a very nice idea of actually playing the move knight f to d7 and the move f5 to get sort of a total lock on the position on the light squares. Note that you don't want to really be playing this move sort of willy-nilly, because you do have to worry about bishop takes h5 sacrifices, but in this case it is going to be a good move. Uh, probably though, black shouldn't play it unless he's forced to, and so a move like knight e5 is the huge upside to taking on f4. You get this square for your knight, and then this is just going to be a pleasant position for black. I think black is actually slightly better after this exchange on f4. In the game, white did not play f4, instead opting for king g2, and now black plays this move queen d7, which honestly was not my favorite move of all time, because it does take away this square from the knight. I think uh, something a little bit more sensible would actually be to play the move knight f to d7, and if you play f4, once again, now uh, ef4 is perfectly playable, but the move f5 is probably even a little bit of an improvement, and we get a situation like the one I was describing earlier, where f5 is a useful move to sort of take over on the king's side. In the game, queen d7 and f3 was actually the opponent's choice. Uh, B, or e4 was played in the game by Papi Ioano, and this is probably not a great move after takes on e4, and you get some complications, but at the end of the day, uh, very serious troubles could be coming black's way. Uh, and I think, in fact, are coming black's way in this position. This wasn't found in the game, though, but important to note, e4, not super advisable in this position. I much prefer the ideas of moving the knight out of the way and playing f5 here. Knight e8 is even a perfectly fine move uh, with the idea of f5 to, uh, to follow. And this knight can come back. So e4 played in the game, though, and then there were some complications here. I don't want to spend too much time on this. This knight got into d3 and we have just some position where black sacrificed in exchange, but is not really worse here with two pawns and a very strong d pawn, and this game was eventually drawn. Uh, so what are the key points I want to point out here? Uh, the point is eight bishop e3 is an idea to delay castling for a bit to keep some ideas of queenside castling alive. After bishop e6, h4 is a very nice inclusion by white, to not force h5, but induce h5, which is something that I'm actually quite happy to do. Now after knight d5, we can't play knight d7, because white would take on e7 and play bishop g5. So we take on d5, e takes d5, knight bd7, c4 supports our d-pawn, rook c8 is a good inclusion to make some threats of playing b5, a4 to stop b5 was played in the game, uh, and then after this, a5 locks down the position. Don't really want to allow a5 by white. Knight d2, and now from here, black activates his pieces, and instead of queen d7, I like the plan of playing knight f d7, or even knight e8 to g7, uh, but mainly with the idea of pushing f5 and getting a lock on the king's side and in the center. The important thing for black to worry about is this move f4. You want to be calculating the move f4 pretty much on every turn, making sure you are well equipped to meet this threat by white. Ready to jump into e5 with the knight, ready maybe to play f5 to lock things down, ready to bring your bishop to f6 to control some of these dark squares. You just need to be ready to meet f4. That's kind of the only real danger that black faces in this line. Um, okay, uh, aside from that, I really don't think that white has too many threats in this position, and like I said, given enough time, f5, and black can think about pushing in the center, black can think about activating this bishop on f6, and black's play shouldn't be too difficult to find. All right, that is this eight bishop e3 line that I wanted to talk about. 
Once again, delaying cast link, but committing the bishop, allowing bishop e6. Uh, all right, moving on. Uh, now I wanted to take a look at the most aggressive variations, I think, in this bishop e2 line. Looking from the black perspective, we have, of course, the starting moves in the knight orf, knight c3, a6, bishop e2, and now e5, knight back to b3, bishop e7. And from here now, we've covered all of the lines involving castling really early on. We've covered eight bishop e3, and now it's time to look at those scary, terrifying pawn moves on the king side that we've kind of come to expect in this type of line in the Nidorf. So let's start with the ones that uh, don't make quite as much sense here. Sorry, I'm losing track of my lines. Let me click this button really quick. OK. Apologies. Here we go. Uh, so the move f4 is probably the one that makes the least amount of sense for the same reasons as in the first lecture. Uh, f4 after bishop e3 means we can take here and the bishop wastes to tempo. But if f4 is played before this bishop moves, that means we should still have our bishop back on c8, not yet coming to e6. And because of that, f5 isn't really a threat. So we can duly ignore this pawn and use the weakness on the light squares to our advantage by castling, castling, and then playing the move b5 and going after the e4 pawn by developing our bishop along this diagonal. This is why f4 generally isn't played unless this bishop has already come to e6. And this is going to hold true here as well. And this is just very, very similar to those positions in the first lecture. So f4 doesn't make the most amount of sense. Now, earlier on, I mentioned this move h4 uh, in these lines with bishop e3. Of course, the difference here is with h4 immediately, bishop e3 has not yet been committed, so the move h5 would actually be a bit of a mistake here, because bishop g5 in one turn is going to be a pretty desirable thing for white to accomplish here, rather than the stutter step. So rather than play h5, you can simply just develop with the move bishop e6. Now, what's the scary thing about playing bishop e6? Well, of course, now we cannot do this plan that I just mentioned against f4. So h4 is actually going for a slightly improved variation uh, based on playing f4 immediately here. And I think this is actually a slightly relevant line. Uh, now, there are many things that black can do here. You can try to ignore this f pawn and allow a push like f5 to happen when your bishop is going to retreat. But I think it makes the most sense to still just take on f4. And after bishop takes f4, we have a situation here where you can compare this position uh, to this position. What's the difference? The difference is white got to put this pawn on h4 for free. Now, is that a bad thing for white or a good thing for white? Kind of remains to be seen. Uh, of course, the obvious upside is that he's taking a bit more space with this pawn on h4, attacking the g5 square. These ideas might come a bit faster. The downside is he is losing a little bit of control over the g4 square and the g3 square. And this king is going to be a little bit less comfortable uh, castling king's side. So all in all, I think it's a pretty balanced trade-off, and I think black should still be doing fine here. Uh, there is one game in the database between Alexeyenko and Alexei Serana that went with knight c6. And from here, the move queen d3 was white's choice. Uh, the idea here is to prevent black's breaking move in the position, which is the move d5. This is sort of how black is hoping to equalize against these ideas of f4 with e takes f4. So d5 is the idea to equalize. Here, uh, white actually would have a pretty good response with the move queen g3, uh, when all of a sudden things on the king's side are looking a little bit scary for black. This might actually be playable, but there's no reason to allow this. Uh, black actually has a very good move here, and that move is knight b4. And now black, white sort of has to say, you know, okay, my queen's attacked, I'll step back to d2 anyways. And after queen d2, of course, the move d5 comes to mind. And this game between Alexanko and Serana continued with a3, d4, takes on b4, takes on c3. And now black regains this pawn on e4 and shouldn't ever really be worse. Queen e4, knight f6, rook d1. 
queen c8. And they played some more moves in this game, but black really was in no danger at all. So that is the move queen to d3. If white tries to play queen d2 immediately, though, avoiding this knight b4 nonsense, now this is sort of the green light to play the move d5. And there's a game in the database here between two slightly lower level players, and that game went with e5. And in the game, uh, knight d7 was played, which is a pretty bad move. Knight e4 is actually going to be the best move here. And after takes, 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 uh, once again, black is just going to have very active bishops. And this is, in fact, going to be a case where maybe white would rather have this pawn back on h2 rather than the h4 square. So like I said, always going to be a trade-off with this h pawn. Uh, okay, so once again, with h4, we play bishop e6, not h5 in this case. f4 is the natural follow-up, and just simply takes knight c6 and go for this idea of d5 to equalize, either after knight b4 in the case of queen d3, or just directly in the case of queen to d2. Mm -hmm. All right, any questions on these aggressive variations for white? Uh, actually, sorry, I forgot to cover the uh, third aggressive variation. So we've looked at f4 immediately, which doesn't make sense. We've looked at h4 followed by f4, which makes a bit of sense, but black can equalize. Now, of course, the move g4 sort of deserves a look as well. This is actually the most common of these three uh, kind of aggressive variations. And in this case, it does make sense for uh, black to stop the move g5 with the move h6. If a move like bishop e6, g5 is actually going to be a little bit annoying with all of this space going to white kind of directly. So the move h6 comes to mind just to prevent this guy uh, from going any further. And now if white is sort of sub stubbornly insisting with a move like h4, well, g5 is still going to be hard to do. We can just simply take. You can't take back with the pawn, obviously. And bishop takes, we can just develop. And we get to keep our pieces on their nice little squares without really yielding to a move like g5. Uh, a better move would be bishop e3, just getting developed again. Uh, after having forced h6, bishop e6, and rook g1 is a natural follow-up to keep this, these ideas alive. But thankfully here, black doesn't have to do anything too special. Just develop your pieces. In this case, I think the c6 square makes a bit more sense than the uh, d7 square. Uh, and the reason for that is because we're a little bit more interested in these kinds of squares in this particular variation because white is so very clearly not castling kingside anymore, and we might someday want to sort of launch an attack using these forwardmost squares rather than these squares over here. So knight c6, I think, makes sense. And after knight d5, rook c8 is always a very, very natural move, and it is here as well. Uh, also, of course, rook c8 is stepping out of the threat of bishop b6 once again. Once again, if knight takes e4, bishop b6 would be the idea. So rook c8 does make this a threat. And then in the game here between Lazaro Bruzon Batista and Vasily Ivanchuk, bishop f3 was played to defend this pawn. We saw bishop takes d5, e takes d5. Now knight a5 was black's choice, and black was actually pretty significantly better in this game. And Ivanchuk did go on to win with this knight landing on the c4 square. Uh, just uncomfortable position for these bishops. And these two moves are actually looking a little bit silly uh, because white's attack is not really coming with too much force on the king's side. So this is g4. Uh, once again, g4, h6 to stop g5, and then just normal development can kind of ensue. Developing out to c6, this rook coming to c8, renewing this threat. We take off the knight on d5, and then we just get our knight into some very natural squares. And it's going to be a pretty standard play on the queen side as black here. Mm -mm. This is basically a freak attack. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, having played the Nidorf in a ton of you know just casual blitz games these days, uh, you're going to run into a lot of people like this who just want to play g4 and try to come kill you. And so it is useful, I think, to look at these lines, even if they're not the most common at high levels. Uh, just as an example, the game continued knight d2, knight c4, and this rook actually maneuvered all the way over to e4, 
which was a bit of a mistake. A lot simpler was just playing the move rook c8, and this is going to be a very pleasant position for black. In fact, black may just be winning this pawn uh, sort of by force in a lot of cases. For example, c3, queen a5, and this guy is already very, very difficult to defend. Bishop f3, you run into the move uh, e4. And things are, are starting to look very, very nasty for, uh, for white. Just for example, this is not what you want to see uh, on the board if you're playing with the white pieces. Uh, okay, so yeah, rook c8 would have been simpler, and black can just pressure this d5 pawn. Black can play for space on the queen side, and once again, maybe some caution is going to have to be exercised uh, in regards to this g4 pawn, but it's not really amounting to anything. So, any questions on these g4, f4, h4 lines, where white sort of just tries to kill you uh, immediately in these knight or variations? Mm -mm. Yes, good evening to Manny. Any questions? Last call. Mm. Okay, well then, I wanted to move on to the last sort of ideas, uh, and they both have different seventh moves, but they both have very, very similar ideas at heart. So just to keep it uh, all in order, let's start with the idea involving knight b3 still, and then we'll move on to knight f3. But these two lines are going to be pretty similar, as we can see. So we have our opening moves, e5. Now knight f3 is what we're going to look at next, but we're going to still look at knight b3 here, bishop e7, and now bishop g5 is an interesting move to take a look at. And I say this line is similar to the knight f3 line because both of these lines are going to revolve around just trying to lock down the d5 square, as we've seen in some cases with things like queen d3 before. However, this is sort of white really, really committing to just going for this d5 square, nothing else. Uh, and whenever white does do this, uh, as we've seen, this bishop moves, it's the clear to move our bishop out to e6 as well, because f4 no longer makes sense. Uh, that is going to be the case here, and it's also going to be even more important here, because we want to control d5 sort of immediately, uh, before white gets a chance to sort of put a lock on the position. So bishop e6, just for example, if you castled here, you might be running into some ideas of playing uh, even a4, locking down b5, and moves like bishop c4 to follow. Uh, but bishop b6 immediately is good. Bishop takes, now queen d3 is a, the most common move in the position. Uh, you can kind of combine this idea with knight d5 in many, many cases. In this case, it's less about controlling the e4 pawn, because obviously this knight has been removed and more about giving white the option to, uh, to castle queen's side here. Uh, so queen d3 first makes a lot of sense. And now the line I'm actually going to recommend is a little bit counterintuitive. Uh, black can do many things here, including knight c6, including castles, including bringing this bishop out to g5. But the line I like the best just goes simply bishop back to e7. And what's the point of this move? Well, the point of this move is you defend the d6 pawn. So after white castles queenside, for example, you can just play the move knight d7. Uh, and now this guy is well defended. Now knight d5 can follow. Uh, this is sort of the main idea of the way black, white has been playing. And we're just going to capture on d5. Queen takes d5. And after queen c7, king b1 is natural. Black is just going to castle king's side, and we're going to have a typical opposite side's castling position here, where black is going to be pushing on the queen side, white is going to be pushing on the king side, and I think in this case, black's play is actually coming uh, a little bit faster. If white isn't careful, uh, you could end up with uh, a serious disadvantage here with the white pieces. For example, h4 would be a natural move, but after b5, g4, Knight b6, for example, queen d3, a5. Uh, in this position, this is something that's been reached a few times already, and it's clear that with a4 coming with tempo, b4 and a3 coming soon to follow, uh, it's going to be black with the faster play on the queen side here. Uh, just for example, if white got greedy and tried to take on b5, this would be pretty awful. After a4 and a3, 
when these threats are becoming very, very difficult to stop. For example, B3 would be a game ender already. Uh, yeah, nothing much to do here for white. So, once again, just to recap, if white tries this queenside castling business, we're just going to snap on d5, play queen c7, and start pushing on the queenside after getting our king safe and sound over here on g8. Uh, now, white can try to be a bit more clever rather than allowing this trade. Uh, I do think this is the natural way to play for white. Getting this knight to d5 is sort of the purpose of this bishop g5 move. But white can sort of delay it with something like g3, going for f4. But black's play is going to be pretty much identical here. f4, b5. And now if you don't play knight d5 soon, you might never play it after a move like knight b6. And if knight d5, we are pretty much transposing with moves like queen c7. And the same idea is to follow for black. If you don't play this move, something like king b1, uh, well, now knight b6 is going to come on the board. And this, I think, is also going to be pretty pleasant for the black pieces. Uh, OK. So let's talk about if white kingside castles instead. Uh, this is going to be pretty similar to stuff we've looked at in the first lecture with ideas of queen d3 and bishop g5 to follow. Uh, but we just develop our knight, knight bd7. Uh, and actually, here I'm... Here. Nope. Yeah, this is the line. Okay, sorry. Mixed up my lines for a second. But yeah, these are going to be the similar ideas. If white isn't capturing on f6, we're just going to take back with the knight now. And life is going to be pretty simple here for uh, black. If white tries to castle kingside, that is... Uh, okay, so that is the bishop g5 line, and this is not the most popular line because obviously it's, it's not really the most testing line, and white could end up in some danger if he does go for these queenside castling lines. Now let's get to the earliest deviation we can look at here. In every line we've looked at so far, we've gone over knight b3, and I think we've just about covered all the relevant variations after knight b3. There might be an oddball line here or there that didn't get a specific mention, but hopefully you guys are feeling comfortable with these ideas around knight b3 now. Now, let's take a look at the move knight f3, which was championed by the world champion uh, a few years back. Looks like 2017 uh, was when he was first starting to play this. So let me swap over here, knight f3. Uh, what is the idea of knight f3. At first glance, this move sort of looks entirely counterintuitive. It is pretty severely limiting white's options on the king's side. You know, no more of this g4, h4, or f4 business ever really happening with this knight in the way. Uh, this knight isn't ever sort of limiting black's play on the queen's side with knight a5 ideas. And this, this knight just quite frankly looks like it's blocking all of white's pieces. So why? come back to f3? Well, it's actually with the pretty deep idea of getting this knight to the e3 square in some manner. These are two of the most common kind of routes for it to take. Uh, and of course, from e3, it controls f5 and the very, very key square on d5. So this is the deep idea behind knight f3. However, we'll see that if black plays quickly, uh, the, the, white's knight dream, the white knight's dream of getting to e3 might never really be realized. So we're going to develop the same way we have been, bishop e7, bishop g5. And this is, of course, the similarity to the line we just looked at, all about the d5 square still. still. Bishop e6, we'll take on f6, take on f6, and now kingside castles. Of course, queenside castling ideas make a little bit less sense here with this knight on f3. Uh, once again, uh, I'm going to recommend the same type of play that we saw against the queenside castle variations. We're just going to drop this bishop back to e7 with the idea of getting this knight out on the d7 square. Uh, now, if the move knight d5, this is sort of the idea so far, and in all of the games that have reached this position, white is going knight d5. Once again, simply knight d7. Now, bishop c4 makes a lot of sense for white just to kind of support this knight from behind. 
And here, I very much like the move rook c8. Uh, whenever possible, I think rook c8 ha is just always a good move. Uh, I kind of have yet to see a position where I really wanted to play rook c8, it, but for some reason it was bad. It, it just really does seem to be good whenever it looks natural to play it. So rook c8, always going to be a good move. Well, I'm obviously not always, but almost always is a good idea in these positions. Now in every game so far, queen e2 has been the choice here. And so far we're following the likes of Fabiano Caruana against Alexander Grishuk, Etienne Bacro against Arashchenko, and Jordan von Forest against Kokorev, who is a player I'm not totally familiar with. Uh, and believe it or not, white has won all three of those games. So clearly we need to be a little bit careful here with black, you know, this idea is not so superficial that white is not winning any games. Clearly, uh, the, the players with the white pieces kind of know what they're doing here. So there is sort of a split here in six games that have reached this position. The most popular move is this move knight b6, when in every game knight takes b6, queen takes b6, and either bishop b3 or takes on e6 has been played. But I actually prefer the line chosen by uh, let's see, which, which game are we following here? By Kokorev, which was the move b5 against Jordan von Forest. Uh, b5 forces this bishop back to b3 directly. If this bishop comes back to d3, I think black is quite happy to take on d5, so bishop b3. And now rather than trade this knight for this knight, we get to plant this knight up here on the c5 square. And the reason I like this line a little bit better is because now, White is really always going to be dealing with uh, these threats of knight takes, b th uh, knight takes b3 in many cases. He's also going to be dealing with threats of knight takes e4 in pretty much every position. Uh, additionally, with this pawn on b5 and the knight on c5, black is going to have very good control over the a4 square, which is a break that white would very much love to play. In the game, rook f to d1 was played and black castled, which makes uh, perfect sense. Uh, now, in the game, the move a4 was chosen, and I think this actually does hand the advantage over to black. So let's take a look at some of the ideas here for black. And actually, I, I want to ask the chat room, what do you think black should be playing in response to the move a4? What kind of moves are coming to mind here? Keeping in mind our ideas with this knight on c5. Okay, we've got some ideas being tossed around in the chat. Knight takes b3, b4 has been mentioned. Knight takes b3 followed by b4. Exchange in b4, take the bishop, queen a5. So you guys are on the right track here. There's actually uh, a lot of options available for black. I think the best one is actually one that you guys have not mentioned so far. Uh, believe it or not. And that thing I want to talk about is trying to win this a4 pawn directly. Or if you're not winning the a4 pawn, forcing some very serious concessions by white. So the move knight takes b3 I don't think is bad. It does force c takes b3. But uh, now white is still going to be getting an open file on the a file. So for example, if b takes a4, white's not even going to take back with the pawn, but just take back with the rook and the a6 pawn is going to be rather difficult to defend. So rather than immediately taking on b3, I actually quite like taking on the, on the d5 square first. Uh, and the reason for this is white doesn't really have a comfortable way to recapture this guy. If pawn takes, now this is going to be our go-ahead to take on b3 and just play the move queen b6. And now there's no weak a6 pawn that our opponent is going to get, we control the open file, and this rook looks a little bit silly sitting here on d1, staring at its own pawn. Uh, now if rook takes d5, now I do think that b takes a4 is actually a great move, and after bishop takes a4 and queen b6 still, 
all of a sudden this bishop is looking like the worst piece of all time. And it's true that while white has a little bit of pressure on the a6 pawn, black can more than make up for it with, its pr with his pressure on the queenside pawns for white as well. For example here, if c3, now suddenly the move queen b7 comes to mind as well. We are pressuring e4. We are more or less threatening to play the move f5 directly. If something like knight e1, for example, trying once again to desperately get to this big maneuver, f5 immediately would be very intuitive and very good for what for black. And I think this is going to be a better position for, for black, in fact. Which leaves us with white's, white's third option of bishop takes d5. This might actually be white's best try, just abandoning the a4 pawn altogether. And after c3, queen c7, uh, kind of returning to these ideas uh, does make some sense for white, but it is going to cost him a pawn to do it. Uh, and so I think black is doing just fine here as well, with white kind of having some unclear compensation for this pawn. He does have a nice looking bishop, and his knight has a future, but, you know, a pawn is a pawn, as they say. Uh, okay. That is all to say that I don't think a4 is really the best move here for white because black does have these tactical ideas to sort of get some kind of advantage in any line that he chooses. So the question sort of remains, what happens if knight e1? Of course, this is the kind of idea that white was going for initially. Like I said, rerouting this piece over to uh, the e3 square is definitely something on white's mind here. So how should black play in response to this? Well, I think it's still actually just going to revolve around making this bishop look like a dummy. So how can we do that here? Well, we can do that with the move a5. a5 is highlighting the fact that this bishop does not have too many squares. If white dares to capture on b5, well, look out after something like a4. Uh, this bishop is still quite stuck. Uh, for example, takes, takes, uh, takes, takes. And it's going to be tough for white to sort of keep this extra pawn with all of these various weaknesses kind of appearing in the position. Uh, for example, the number one engine line goes knight d3, knight takes e4, queen takes a4, knight back to g5. And uh, from here, black's going to have a very big center uh, and pressure on the king side as well. And I think this is more than enough compensation here for, for black to be perfectly happy. Uh, okay. So once again, if white kind of reverts back to normal, we start playing these a5, a4 ideas. Uh, and this is going to be, I think, pretty comfortable for black, activating this bishop as well. So these ideas of knight e3 aren't going to be coming with as much power. Uh, now, of course, knight c2 would be a huge blunder, so white might even go for something like g3, trying to develop this way. And now, once again, ideas of a4 start coming to mind for black. Rook b8 to follow. And at some point, black might take on d5 and push b4, opening up the queen side uh, in his favor. Mm -mm. Okay, so any questions on this knight f3 line? Once again, we have knight f3 followed by bishop g5. This is sort of the, uh, the point of these knight f3 lines is to take on f6, loosen up the d5 square, and go for these big maneuvers. We have takes takes, castles, bishop back to e7, knight d7, rook c8, uh, queen e2 defending the bishop. And now I do like this line with b5 and knight c5. And black now just has this latent pressure on the bishop on the queen side as well as white's center. The game could continue like this. a4 was played by Jordan and Forrest, and now bishop takes d5 would have been an advantage for black after something like takes and knight takes a4. Uh, and once again, the point is our opponent doesn't really have time to go for stuff like knight e1 because we're going to be advancing on the queen side so, so quickly. If you want to be a little bit more conservative, you can probably even start with the move rook b8 and then go for this type of stuff as well. For example, c3, bishop g5, uh, bishop back to c2, and something like a5 here. And this is also pretty sensible for black, although I do like the move a5 immediately the most, because these queen takes b5 lines 
really don't lead to much for, uh, for white. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, d6 guarded by the bishop on e7 is safer than Alcatraz. That is one way to put it for sure. Uh, okay. So that is pretty much all of the lines in the uh, bishop e2 variation that I wanted to cover. So let's review. Uh, I'm going to try to review pretty much everything here in the next 10 minutes, just giving you sort of the bullet point list thing that you need to know. So starting off, we have, of course, the bishop e2, knight orf, e5. Now there are two moves here, knight b3 and knight f3. We just looked at knight f3, so let's look back at knight b3. We develop bishop e7, waiting to develop bishop e6 until white commits this bishop to e3. We have castles, castles. Uh, once again, waiting to develop this bishop until this bishop comes to e3. Bishop e3, bishop e6. Queen d2 is the most common line. We're just going to develop with knight bd7 with the ideas of b5 and knight, uh, knight b6 to c4. a4 stops these ideas, so now we switch to knight c5 ideas. Rook c8, queen c7, uh, rook f to d8, and knight c5. The point being, after takes and takes, uh, white now has to choose between playing knight d5 and going for these types of positions with the bishop on d6, uh, or just leaving this position sort of as is when black can play c4, go for ideas of bishop b4, and sort of try to paralyze the white pieces. Uh, okay, that is this bishop e3 line, the main main line with queen d2. We developed towards the queen side, ideas of here, ideas of knight c5. Moving on, we have, instead of bishop e3 in this case, the move king h1 is a clever waiting move. And here, bishop e6 would be met by f4, b5 would be met by a4, but I do like the move b6, the point being you're not allowing either of these moves to come with force. Now after f3, bishop b7. Uh, a4 to try to lock things down on the queen side. A4 is our signal to play the move knight c6 and go for the b4 square. And now we, of course, are going for the move d5. Okay, breaking in the center, and then black has no issues. If, black, if white plays a little bit differently with bishop e3 and f3, then we do take the opportunity to play b5 and b4. And with this structure, we are happy to pressure the center as well as activate our bishop along g5. Okay, up next, we have the queen d3 idea for white. Uh, with queen d3, white is defending the e4 pawn and preparing to play knight d5. So bishop e6, bishop d2 is a clever idea to control the a5 square. Knight bd7, knight d5, we take this guy and play knight e8, going for counterplay on the king's side. You can play a5 if you want to stop the move knight a5 and be a bit safer, but knight e8, going for f5 immediately, I think is good enough for black. You activate on the king's side, pushing in the center. Okay, up next we have the idea of knight b3, castles, castles, with 9a4. So bishop e3, we're developing normally, king h1, we are playing b6 and developing this way. a4, immediately stopping b5. We are playing knight c6 once again. a4, our green light to go after the b4 square. And play could continue with something like f4, knight b4, b6, bishop b7. And breaking in the middle with d5, as is the idea of knight to b4. And this position is going to be fine for black. Okay, now let's look at the first thing we looked at today. Eight, bishop e3, that's our green light to develop this bishop. Bishop e3, h4 to provoke h5. Now knight d5, we have to take this guy. Important move here, rook c8, challenging the c-pawn on the c-file. a4, a5, knight d2. And then here, of course, we have to be on the lookout for the move f4, making sure we have a good response. And I think the natural play for black comes after knight fd7 and expanding with the move f5. Just for example, something like this is very natural. 
This knight can come back. This bishop can drop back on, e on g7. And play would continue from there. Uh, let's look at the aggressive lines once again, very, very briefly. We have stuff like g4. We just play h6 to guard this guy and then develop normally. We're not so worried about g5 after the move h6. And in this game, Ivan Shuk was much better and would have been much better after rook c8 uh, when this pawn is difficult to defend. All right, now back to these ideas we just looked at. Bishop g5, of course, is taking over the d5 square. If white goes for lines with castling queenside, we're not so worried. We snatch the knight on d5, play queen c7, and expand on the queen side. And then lastly, we just looked at these ideas of knight f3. And here, we play the same way, developing with bishop e7 and knight out to d7. And now, we take over the queen side with b5 and knight c5 with pressure everywhere. Okay, that is my five minute review of the bishop e2 Nidor for these two hours uh, of lectures that I've done now. Uh, stay tuned for next week when we cover something different entirely. Of course, still in the Nidorf, but I think this is it for Bishop E2. Uh, hopefully, you guys have a good grasp on these positions and these ideas for black in these positions. Sometimes you expand on the king side with F5. Sometimes you expand on the queen side with B5. Uh, and always, you try to keep a hold of the D5 square, as is the Nidorf way. Uh, if you're watching live, we're going to have a tactics class on Twitch directly after this. Be sure to come check it out. If you're watching the YouTube video, that is it for tonight. Thank you so much for joining me, and I will see you next time for Chess Openings Explained.